Thanks everyone for joining us on this Friday afternoon for another virtual mind walk. Uh, the virtual mind walks program is underwritten by the Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Eltsroth Fund and supported by the Central Coast State Parks Association. If you'd like to help support the virtual mind walk program or another state parks educational program, please check out the link that you see on the screen, centralcoastparks.org slash friend. And I'll put this in the chat too. And that's where you can make a donation to the Central Coast State Parks Association. Uh, you donate $35 or more to become a friend of the association and receive perks such as store discounts and newsletter subscriptions. And there are several different programs you can choose from to support and make an impact in. And thank you so much to those of you who have donated and um, are already friends of the Central Coast State Parks Association. And um, the link you do see on the screen in front of you, you can um, see future programs listed there too that you can register for. And on that same webpage, you can find recordings of all the past programs. Today we have with us Melissa Douglas and Laura Anderson, and their presentation is titled Impacts of Sea Star Wasting Syndrome and Outlook for Recovery Along California's Central Coast. Melissa Douglas grew up in Los Osos, knowing that she wanted to study marine biology upon graduation from Morro Bay High School. She worked as a student intern in Dr. Pete Raimondi's intertidal monitoring lab at UC Santa Cruz. And after earning her bachelor's degree in marine biology, has continued on as a research specialist monitoring the tide pools for the past 16 years. Laura Anderson completed her undergraduate degree at UC Santa Cruz and then got her master's at UBC in Vancouver, Canada. She now works in the Raimondi lab where she's been conducting intertidal surveys for 13 years with a focus on seaweed restora restoration. Laura, Melissa, and the rest of Dr. Raimondi's teams at UC Santa Cruz monitor the tide pools as part of a large consortium called Marine, conducting the same surveys as 200 plus sites from Alaska to Mexico. Data collected by Marine have been utilized for many purposes, such as analyzing impacts from oil spills and marine diseases, assessing effectiveness of marine protected areas, and informing species management. And today we ask that uh, if you all have questions, you can put them in the chat or Q&A, and then we'll get to those at the end. All right, it's all yours, guys. Thank you for the introduction, Mallory. Let me share my screen. All right, can you see it and hear me? Yeah, look and sound good. Great, thank you very much. All right, thank you all for joining us. Um, Laura and I are really happy to be here today. Um, we are going to talk about uh, what we know about sea stars. All right, so first, oops, a little bit of history about marine. Um, so when the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in 1989, um, it really highlighted the need for monitoring and baseline data. Um, it was realized that uh, assessment of injury to the intertidal could not be, um, could not be assessed without having monitoring data and um, baseline data. So this spurred on the Minerals Management Service, um, which is now the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, to fund UC Santa Barbara to monitor nine sites in Santa Barbara area. Um, the Santa Barbara Channel is really high risk due to oil extraction and being a big shipping lane. Um, also joining Marine in the early days was the National Park Service. Uh, there were sites set up at Channel Islands National Park as well as Cabrillo National Monument. So on this map, you can see that back in 1992, there were just some sites in Southern California. Fast forwarding ahead to today, um, you can see that we have many, many more sites as well as many more partners. These are funding and monitoring partners. So it includes universities, tribes, um, uh, government agencies, the Navy, the Air Force, um, all sorts of people are involved. Um, so we have over 200 sites, as Mallory said in the intro, that are from Alaska to Mexico. Some of these sites have been monitored for over 30 years, and there are 23 monitoring groups that are involved. We have two main types of surveys that we do, biodiversity surveys, which we try and do at each site every three to five years, but is dependent on funding, and long-term monitoring surveys, which we do at every site once or twice a year. 
Laura's going to talk more about biodiversity surveys in a little bit, and I'm going to talk first about long-term monitoring surveys. But first, I want to point out that the really cool thing about marine is that we use standardized protocols along our entire network. Um, this is pretty unique on such a large spatial and temporal scale. Um, usually, projects are, you know, a small region or maybe last for a few years. Um, so to have this uh, large scale monitoring is really, really unique and um, is used for many, many uh, purposes. And uh, Mallory already said some of them, but as uh, she said, oil spill injury. And also we inform marine protected area design and can assess the effectiveness. We can also look at effects from climate change and what we're going to focus on today, which is impacts from marine disease. So we do um, counts and sizes in long term monitoring plots. Uh, for target species, such as abalone, owl limpets, and what we're focusing in on today, which is ochre stars. So ochre sea stars are the ones that you probably see when you go out to the tide pools. Hopefully you still do see some. Um, you'll usually see them as purple, but sometimes they're orange. They live in the mid intertidal down to 90 meters subtidally. Their range is from Alaska to Mexico. They have the ability to regenerate arms. They can live up to 20 years. They have very few predators and they're what's called a keystone species. That means they have a really big impact on their environment. Laura's gonna talk more about that in a little bit. So the way that we monitor um, sea stars are in long-term plots. Um, these plots are marked by bolts that we put out in the intertidal. And we typically have three replicates or three plots per site where we focus on the ochre star. We record their abundance, health, and size. And we also record data on other sea star species and urchins. Uh, we typically are sampling these plots once per year. Now a little bit about sea star wasting syndrome. Um, this event of sea star wasting syndrome was first observed by marine researchers in Washington back in June of 2013. They notified the marine network as well as other researchers to keep on the lookout. And by 2014, most marine sites experienced a crash in ochre stars. Between the subtital and the intertidal, over 20 species were affected at some level, some more than others. This is not the first time that we've seen sea star wasting. Uh, there have been previous events, but they are always much smaller in scale, usually just Southern California. Um, they were always during short water, warm water periods, maybe a few months or a year, and usually like one species. So this is really the first time we've seen such a huge wasting event. Here are um, the symptoms of sea star wasting. On the left, you can see uh, often their arms start curling and they usually get one or two lesions to begin, out with, begin with. And then later on, they often have lesions all over their entire body. They often lose arms and ultimately they usually die. Uh, this is just a small part of the story, but I wanted to mention that there have been a few times where we saw what appeared to be arm regrowth and healing lesions um, after uh, sea star was diseased. We don't know why this would happen to some. Um, it's been extremely rare. And uh, like I said, we don't know uh, what was going on with those ones. Um, so everyone always wants to know about the cause. Uh, unfortunately, after almost nine years, it's still not fully understood. Um, one recent study found that increased organic matter around the sea stars led to higher numbers of microbes, which uh, led to depleted oxygen availability. And this um, low oxygen for their tissues resulted in damage and decomposition. They also found that this was worse in higher water temperatures in more rugose sea star species, so ones that are you know, like more bumpy, and also in larger sea stars. Um, you may have heard a while back that there was a paper that found, um, or thought they found it to be a denzovirus, but a recent study found that that denzovirus was common in healthy stars too. So that was sort of debunked. Um, lab studies also found that stars in cooler temperature water um, had symptoms progress more slowly, but it didn't stop the disease. They typically still died. And then some of you may have remember um, hearing about the marine heat wave that happened back from 2013 to about 2015, known as the warm blob. And it's thought that that likely exacerbated sea star wasting also. So for today, I'm going to focus in on three of our many sites. Um, I picked three sites that are in the San Luis Obispo region. These sites have over 25 years of data. The furthest north is Point Sierra Nevada, which is just south of Ragged Point. Then we have Cayucas and then Hazards Canyon out at Montaña de Oro State Park. So starting with Point Sierra Nevada, um, I have a simple trend graph here, which is just showing um, sea star numbers or ochre star numbers in our sea star plots. 
So over on the y-axis, we have count of C stars in our plots and then just date along the bottom here. So don't worry about the details, the numbers. I just want to show some general trends. Um, you can see that this site had lots of fluctuation. It had a really high point um, around maybe 2004 or so, and then had been on its way down when C star wasting occurred around 2013. You can see that there was a really big drop and then that population has stayed really low since then, except for one peak that happened around, I think it's around 2017 or so. So um, we'll focus in on that peak uh, in a few minutes and see what was going on there. Here's the graph for Cayucas. Um, you can see that it also had quite a bit of natural fluctuation and was also on a bit of a downward trend when sea star wasting hit. Um, it went very low when sea star wasting hit. And these plots um, have stayed really low uh, since sea star wasting hit. And um, actually, the last few years, we've had no ochre stars in our sea star plots at our Cayuga site. And then hazards out at Montana de Oro. You can see um, lots of natural fluctuation. This site had a peak around, I think it was around 2007 or 2008, and had been on a downward trend when sea star wasting hit and brought it really low. Um, it has also stayed low. This is pretty similar to the Point Sierra Nevada graph that we looked at. This one had a peak around, a little peak around 2019 or so, and we'll check out what's going on there in a few minutes. So this is called the heat map. Um, I know it's very overwhelming looking at first, so don't worry, I'll explain how to look at it and then show you uh, sort of the trend that we see here. So we're looking at ochre sea star populations along the entire coast. It's kind of smushing all the data into one graphic. Um, so over here, we're looking at relative population size. The main things to know here are that when you see blue squares, that means an increase in ochre star population. Gray means no change in ochre star population, and red means a decline in ochre star population. We have our sites along the side going from north to south, so from Alaska down to Southern California. And then along the bottom here, we have year. So I think it starts around 1999 and goes to, I believe, 2021 or so. And um, then up at the top, you'll see there's a, um, a line where about when sea star wasting began. So that's that line sort of down the middle is showing kind of the start of sea star wasting. So what you're gonna notice here pretty quickly is that before sea star wasting to the left, you see lots of blue and gray and red, and it's all pretty muted. So that means small changes. We're seeing small little natural fluctuations in the populations at most of the sites. You can see some were declining in Southern California, but overall it's all sort of small natural fluctuations. After sea star wasting started, it's pretty clear that almost all the boxes are red. So pretty much every site was having declines um, every year and um, a lot more dark red. So this, the darkest red here is 99% decline in population. And you can see there's quite a few sites that were having these huge declines. So for the next slide, it's the exact same heat map, but I just zoomed in on the central coast. So Scott Creek here is in the Santa Cruz area up where Laura and I are right now. Boathouse down here is, um, on Vandenberg, and then I circled our three slow um, example sites. So you'll just notice that there was lots of natural fluctuations like we saw when we looked at the other graphs. And then you can see zoomed in here that all of these sites had red squares, um, meaning decrease in population after sea star wasting started. So I'm gonna start talking a little bit about potential for recovery. Before I do that, um, I just wanna give a very, very brief overview on how sea stars reproduce. Um, basically, they're broadcast spawners, which means that they spew their gametes, their sperm and their eggs into the water column. It mixes around, fertilizes, the little larvae swim around in the water in the ocean for a few weeks, and then eventually then they settle down onto the substrate and become the big sea stars that we see when we go out. So here is um, a, this is called a bubble graph. It's really cool for looking at trends of um, size distributions. And it's really handy for looking at uh, the potential for recovery. So I'll explain it very briefly. On this, on this graph, we have uh, along the y-axis here, we have date. So on the top here, we have summer of 2013. We have summer of 20, 2020 along the bottom or on the bottom. And then going from left to right, the sea stars get bigger. So to the left, we have little sea stars. To the right, we have big sea stars. 
And then the size of the black bubble indicates number of sea stars. So one little black dot means one sea star. And in this example, one big black dot means, oh, this one's 150. Don't worry about the numbers. We're just looking at trends. And actually, this is just an example site. I don't even know which site this is, but it's just to show you what you would expect to see for a site that might be on its way to recovery. So the way that you look at it is you can see around 2014 or 2015, there's a lot of babies and you can kind of, it's pretty cool to look at these because you can watch as they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow. And at summer 20, you can see there's kind of a nice distribution of different sizes. Sea stars grow at different rates depending on how much and what they're eating. So um, it spreads out a little bit here, but it looks like a lot of them survived. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show the same type of bubble graphs for the three example sites in slow. It's kind of gonna look a lot, a lot but we're just gonna look at the trend. Um, which will be pretty clear, I think. So on the left here, we have Point Sierra Nevada. In the middle, we have Cayugas. And on the right, we have Hazards. I drew a nice big red line, approximately when sea star wasting started. And so looking at PSN, you can see here when the health population was really healthy, lots of big black circles for all the different sizes. Um, if you remember the graph I showed before, it declined a little bit, but still quite a few of them. You can see after sea star wasting, very few circles. So the population is extremely low. You can see, so if you remember the graph that I showed you um, for PSN, it did have one spike that happened. So now we can see why. There's um, some juveniles that look like they were born maybe around 2015 or so. And you can see that some of them grew up and then it looks here they are probably around 2017 maybe. But it looks like a lot of them did not survive. So if you remember that peak, dropped off um, and whoops, sorry about that. Um, that peak dropped off and you can see that that population is really low. Looking at Cayucas, you can see that after sea star wasting happens, it really just petered out. There's um, only been a couple of juveniles at that site since sea star wasting started. Um, and it looks like this graph got chopped off, right? But it didn't. This is actually, if you remember, I said this site has had zero ochre stars in our plots for the last few years. Um, so that's what's going on there. And then hazards, you can see, uh, this looks really cool. You can see a big uh, recruitment event or um, a baby boom basically that happens back here around 2006. And you can see as sort of as they grow up and um, there's still, you know, it had gone down but there's still quite a few before sea star wasting. After sea star wasting, you can see it really drops off um, to quite a, to many fewer individuals. And then if you remember, hazards also had a little hump around 2019. And we can see why here. You can see that around 2018, 2019, there's a small recruitment event of babies that happens. Um, unfortunately, it looks like not, a, not all of them survived. So there's still some there at hazards. Um, but uh, not enough for recovery. So unfortunately, without having um, big recruitment events, uh, things are not looking great for recovery at the Central Coast sites as of now. Okay, so here's another heat map. It's set up just like the other one I showed you. The difference with this one is that we're now looking at number of juveniles. So for this one, if you see gray, it means no juveniles. If you see light blue, it means few juveniles. And if you see dark blue, it means a lot of juveniles. Again, I have sea star wasting um, right here. And on this one, I circled the Central Coast sites. So you can see that um, Point Sierra Nevada and Cayucas had not really had juveniles for a while. Um, Hazards has fairly consistently, though not a lot. And it looks like as of now, it's not enough to really bring that population back to recovery. And then you can see for the Vandenberg sites, um, there were quite a few juveniles regularly before sea star wasting. And there's some at stairs, but uh, for the last few years, there's been really none there. And if you look to Southern California, um, very few juveniles. So unfortunately to the South, um, things are not looking great. Okay, so I know that this has been a downer. I'm sorry, I wish I had great news for you, but here's a little bit of good news, which is if you look to the um, top of this heat map, you'll see that there is a lot of dark blue um, if for Oregon and Northern California. So some of the sites in Oregon and Northern California are actually having more juveniles than we've ever seen before. And so some of those sites are actually looking like they have a good chance at being on their way to recovery. So some good news. 
All right, why do we care? Um, they're beautiful. Everyone wants to go out to the tide pools and um, see sea stars. We want our kids to be able to go see them. We want grandkids to go see them. And then ecologically, um, they're really important as a keystone predator. And with that, I'm gonna let Laura explain that and um, give us a minute so that she can take over sharing. Thank you. Hey, all, as she said, I'm Laura. Um, we work together at University of Santa, California, Santa Cruz in the lab. And uh, she explained why we care about these charismatic creatures. Um, for a more in-depth definition of a keystone predator, um, I have here that they are disproportionately, or they have a disproportionately large effect on their environment relative to their abundance. So down here in this simplified graphic, you can see we have a few um, ochre stars and they eat mussels, that's their main prey item. And when they're around, they're controlling the number of mussels, which creates space in the intertidal zone where there isn't a ton of space for other things to recruit and grow, such as fleshy algae speech, uh, species pictured here, other invertebrate species. Um, so essentially when they're around, the intertidal zone is more biodiverse, which indicates a healthier system overall. When you remove those um, ochre stars from the system, they're not eating down a lot of these mussels. The mussels are very um, competitively dominant in that zone and can kind of hog up all the space and, and empty spaces and places where other organisms would be growing. And then it sort of creates um, this monocrop of mussels, if you will, and then less biodiversity overall at these sites, um, which is a less healthy environment, uh, essentially. So, um, the kind of weird positive from this situation, uh, the silver lining of sea star wasting syndrome, if you will, is that it's given scientists and biologists like Melissa and myself the opportunity to test this really important hypothesis of keystone predators at a scale that's never been possible before, um, and especially not ethical. We would never go out and do a mani manipulative experiment where we remove 90% of the ochre star population along the entire West Coast. So this happened naturally, and we have been pretty excited to um, follow it and, and track the changes and, and see what's going to happen because of this decline in a really important intertidal species. So one way that we can get at that is through these biodiversity surveys that we conduct that Melissa um, briefly mentioned before. She went into the other type of survey that we do, the long-term monitoring, and now I'll talk about our biodiversity surveys, um, which we use to quantitatively assess community change um, before this uh, disease event happened. And then we're tracking those changes now over time and space using this method. So essentially we go out to a site and we lay out this, um, this top baseline, which is in the high inter intertidal zone. It's permanently marked with bolts. So we can go back to the same exact spot each time. And then we lay out 11 lines that run from the high intertidal down to the low intertidal. Um, and we uh, assess various different things along these lines. So the first type of data we collect is uh, point contact information. So using our fancy handy dandy apps here and our special app that was developed for us, we go along each one of these 11 lines and take 100 points of data usually capturing mostly the sessile organisms that are present. So again, things like mussels and algae and, and different organisms that can't really move that much and are mostly attached to the substrate. We then also take elevation measurements along these lines. Um, this is just a subset of those lines. It's not showing all 11, uh, but we using surveyor's equipment with a laser leveler on a tripod, as you can see here in a stadia rod with a sensor on it we can measure um, the height above sea level uh, along each line here. And then we also search for sea stars along these lines. And um, the type of monitoring that Melissa described earlier uh, only allows for comparing um, or looking at sea star populations individual sites. That's why when she talked about them, she kind of broke them down into what sea stars are doing at Cayucas. And, what sea stars are doing at Point Sierra Nevada. But these, because we take um, densities along these lines, uh, we're able to compare and contrast up and down the coast between sites, not just looking at snapshots of populations at sites. So by uh, taking these sea star data 
and our point contact data and our elevation data, we can make um, three-dimensional maps look a bit like this. This is an example that's closer to our home around Santa Cruz at Davenport Landing, as opposed to um, down around San Luis Obispo, but we can do this uh, for any site that we sample. Um, this here is the high intertidal zone up here where my mouse is. And then down here, we have the low intertidal zone and you can see the topography at that site. It's not a super rugose or um, intricate site, but you can see there's some valleys and, and peaks and, and rocks and what have you. And then in blue here, we have pictured all the points along those lines where we encounter mussels. So this is the mid tidal zone where we find mussels. And then all of the red points are where we found sea stars at that site. And you can see they live a little lower down. They like to stay a little wetter than the mussels and they crawl up from uh, the subtitle or underwater and up to this edge of the muscle zone and that begin to eat and kind of control where the muscles occur at the site. So as she said, we go to these sites about once every three to five years, depending on funding and other access issues. But by taking these same data over time, we can map and see how things change and move and if densities decline. Um, this is that same thing kind of shown in a picture. Again, this is a little closer to our home. Up there. Uh, this site is in Monterey, Stillwater Cove. Um, and this panoramic photo was taken in the spring of 2014. You can see this is the high intertidal zone. And then in the middle intertidal is where we find uh, most of the mussels. It's kind of this gray blue band here. Those are mussels growing in the intertidal zone. And then below that you have kind of the the fleshy algae that need to stay submerged for longer and um, more intricate species, different types of birds here. And just we went back and took the same photo. And you can see uh, with the decline of the sea stars happening right around this time from sea star wasting syndrome, this muscle bed in just one year really expanded. You can see the gray there now goes all the way down into where a lot of algae were growing. Um, and there could be other reasons for this, you know, it could have been an amazing like bumper year for muscle recruitment, but because we've been surveying this site for over 15 years, we've never seen that occur before. And so it's highly likely that it was the removal of sea stars from the disease that, that allowed this expansion to occur and then thereby a reduction in kind of um, overall site biodiversity. So, um, We've mostly been talking about the ochre star up until now, but uh, we do enter other sea stars in our plots and along those biodiversity lines. And one of the species we come into contact with are sunflower stars or Pycnopodia helianthoides. Um, they are a bit more subtital species. Um, and this is what they can look like under they're really pretty abundant. Uh, like I said, find them in the inner titles too at the, at the ends of our low, low uh, lines and in some of our lower plots. This is what they look like when they're uh, above water in the intertidal zone. And they are also a very important species. Um, you could even call them a super keystone predator if you would like, because they really only have one predator, which is another sea star that's not super abundant and it's pretty, uh, it ranges pretty far north. Um, so there's not a lot of pressure on them in terms of getting eaten, but they exert a ton of pressure on all sorts of other things. Um, the ochre stars really prefer and, and mostly eat mussels, whereas these eat all sorts of herbivores, this whole big list of snails, um, eat carnivores, this is a big snail. Uh, these are, they eat other stars. Uh, in fact, even the Pisostrocratius, the ochre star that we've been talking about can be eaten by these. Planktivores, um, <clears throat> all these are some different types of herbivores. Uh, the mussels that they prefer are in this category. Um, and then they eat detritivores, so um, sea cucumbers, uh, other snails over here, and then specifically they like to eat sea urchins, which is picked here. This is a sunflower star uh, caught in the act of digesting a sea urchin. And I don't know how many of you know, but another story going on in our oceans right now uh, involving sea urchins um, and kelp forests. And, Kelp forests are uh, kind of another version of the biodiverse intertidal zone. You know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of structure. There's algae that provides habitat for other organisms. 
the more biodiverse it is, the healthier the system is considered. Um, but there are these urchins that live there and when they're and they go unchecked by predators, they can have a big impact on kelps and algae and eat them down and reduce kelp forests. And there are other players in the story, such as um, increased seawater temperatures, and it depends on how many um, sea otters are around. But we did find through our monitoring um, that during sea star wasting syndrome, this type of sea star was really hardly hit um, hit hard as well. Sorry. And uh, you can see that collapse here in the graph. I have the density of these sea stars on the Y per meter squared. And then you're on the X here uh, from the 80 year through to 2020. The blue bars are pre sea surfacing syndrome um, densities. And then I have the arrow here depicting when that wasting began in 2013, 2014. The red bars are. Um, during the height of wasting syndrome. And the green bars say post wasting, but that's kind of a silly term because it does exist still at low levels. So uh, it's ongoing. It's not like wasting has stopped, but that's just the way this graph was made. Um, as you can see, just like a lot of Mel's graphs, there's natural uh, variation going on over time for tracking. There was a really great year here around 2003. And then that wasting hit in around 2013, 2014, and there was a huge precipitous drop off of these organisms, which is um, really sad. It's a big bummer. We lost over 97% of the population along the entire West Coast. Um, <clears throat> another way to see that is through these maps. Uh, we receive observations from people along the entire uh, coast that get on our website, which I'm gonna talk about more in a little bit. But you can see here this map, uh, it's two years of from 2012-2014, you can see there's lots along the whole coast. Um, and then you look over here, it's another two years, 2020 to 2022. And I want you to kind of zoom in on California here. Um, whereas on the map on the left, tons of observations all up and down the coast. Over here, essentially gone um, locally extinct. They haven't been seen in California um, hardly at all through this in this time period. Um, and as I said, they really like to eat urchins when they're not around to keep them in check. You get things like these urchins, which the urchins explode, they eat all the kelp, the kelp is supporting myriad different species, the biodiversity drops, and you get, and it's kind of like a monoculture of these or a monocrop of these um, urchins, which is a bit of a bummer. But as I said, it's a um, very intricate thing. Uh, the stars are not the only thing playing into this, but they, they do play a part. Um, so because of this big drop and the concern for the species, uh, this group was formed, um, Nepodia Recovery Working Group. Mostly it was a collaboration between Oregon State University and the Nature Conservancy. Um, they were able to get these species listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list, which generated a ton of awareness um, amongst the public and managers and uh, others. And it's also, um, they're developing and supporting um, some recovery strategies. So I'm jumping around the coast a bit more than Mel did. She was able to zoom in on your specific area, but um, these stars are a little bit more abundant up north. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit, as you've seen, some of my photos are from British Columbia and Washington. And, and now this example that I'm gonna talk about is also in Washington up at Friday Harbor Laboratories. Um, they have started a captive breeding program up there uh, that they're mainly using to just gain more basic biological information. There's um, some genetic studies going on. Basically this big decline in this really important species has gained a lot of um, interest and attention and, and things are being done. We're, we're working on, on this. Uh, so like I said, uh, or sorry, as Mel went over, uh, the recovery options are kind of outlook for ochre stars. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that for the sunflower star. Uh, we had um, just this year from March 2021 to 2022, we have had um, a lot of reports of these stars being seen uh, generally in the one to three individual range. There were observations in Oregon that were all under 25 meters. 
so pretty small. Um, and then we've had a few reports that are up, uh, up to 10 to 12, uh, 20 individuals. And then very rarely we'll have some reports of 20 individuals. That's further north, mostly around um, British Columbia. But um, most of these individuals that were seen during this year were healthy, which is good news. Only seven of these were diseased. And then they've also been a mix of juveniles and uh, so um, the top line here are little babies pictured. That's what they look like. And these are sort of grown up. Um, so the first thing, babies is a good sign. We're hoping they can survive and, and grow up and help repopulate uh, some of these stars. Um, <clears throat> Also of note and on a more positive um, note, which is exciting, is that uh, there's been a sighting of stars in California for the first time uh, since January of 2018. So that happened in November, uh, just this last fall in 2021. Three healthy adults were seen in the intertidal zone up in Dino. Um, and these are pictures of them here. And it's possible there were some juveniles seen at that site as well, but photos weren't taken, so we couldn't confirm that. We're hoping to um, be able to confirm that sometime later in the future. So that's some good news. It's very exciting. We're really happy to see that there are a few in California still um, that hopefully can reproduce and, and grow their population a bit. All right, so I've been talking about these observations we receive. And um, since we are just a few uh, individuals, you know, a group of biologists and researchers um, that can only be in so many places at, at one time when the tide is low, uh, we've gotten help from a bunch of different uh, groups and organizations um, that are doing collaborative monitoring with us. It's um, interested community scientists that have reached out and we've um, kind of trained them in our protocols and how we search for stars and how we measure them. And they have taken that and run and kept collecting data on their own in similar ways to us. And then they share that data with us. Um, you can go on our website and check that out and see who else gotten involved and look at their um, web pages website and look at graphs of their the data they've been seeing where, where they are up and down the coast. These are just some examples. A lot of these people are up in Washington. Um, so it's been really helpful to have their help. And then we also get help just from the general public. Anyone um, such as you all listening now could go out uh, for a walk, do a tide pool walk or beach walk. And if you see some stars or you're um, interested in letting someone know what you saw, you can go onto our website, which I have um, pictured here again. This is our main like general website up here, PacificRockInterTidal.org. Um, but if you just want to see our sea star information, we have a direct URL to that, which is SeaStarWasting.org. And I'll put these up again towards the end of the talk so you can write them down or um, find them again. But anyways, you can uh, make observations and submit them and then they get onto our map that we have pictured here. Um, you can have dots that are orange, which is where people have seen disease stars. The blue ones are where health stars have been seen. And then the gray dots are um, kind of past data that we've grayed out from 2020 back to 2012, just to um, highlight the more recent ones. You can click, oops, sorry. You can click on any of these dots and uh, information will pop up about the specific site that you're interested in. For instance, I chose an example in your backyard of uh, Piedras Blancas. You can see the last time a submission was made of any observations there was in July of 2021. Sorry, that'll light the writing there. But anyways, you can see which sea star species was uh, diseased at that site, which species were healthy and seen, and then who submitted that. And if you click down here, again, this is really small writing, I apologize, but there's a site observation history link that you can click on. And then a chart like this will appear and um, you'll see how many times observations have been submitted for that site, whether disease was present, um, which ones were diseased, what were healthy, um, who made the observations and then um, that type of thing. So if you want to go on our website to make a submission of this kind, this is blog that would show up, There's some drop down menus and some questions you answer. Um, then you'd submit it and it would get onto the app. Uh, we also have besides that though, some other um, 
resources that you could check out. We have uh, ID guides showing what lesions look like. So you can tell if you are seeing disease stars or if they're healthy or um, healthy disease they are. There's also um, species ID guides. So if you're not sure what type of sea star you're seeing, which, which um, species, you can go on there and check out our guides and see if you're seeing ochre stars or um, you know some other species of a serious example here. Um, besides these, what I'm showing, there are other resources um, such as we upload uh, publications onto that website about sea star wasting, um, news reports and updates and, and that sort of thing. So it's a fun website to check out. Um, again, it has its own email or you can just go to our main overarching website and kind of follow the links and you'll, and you'll find a bunch of stuff on there. Uh, with that, I will wrap it up. Um, and give a little summary. Mel, oops, ah, sorry, moving too fast. Here we go. Mel um, described that the cause is still not really known. Uh, it could be a combination of high water temperatures, high microbes, um, creating low oxygen situations that are all combining to sort of make this environment that is causing the disease to have a really bad impact on these stars. Um, the ochre star populations, as she said, have been impacted throughout their entire range. But we are seeing lots of juvenile recruiting and surviving in Northern California and Oregon at the very least. Unfortunately, um, there's only a few in SunCal and then uh, we didn't talk about it much, but down in Southern California, it's really quite bleak and there are not very many stars uh, surviving or reproducing down there, unfortunately. That's partly because um, this disease does continue to uh, occur at low levels throughout everywhere we've been going and, and monitoring and looking. Um, so that makes us a little unsure of how uh, the future is going to look and, and how much they can or will recover. Um, we are tracking what it looks like since this decline and, and how that's going to play out in the environment uh, and different communities. Um, there have been lots of changes, like I said, and like I showed those pictures of mussels, um, but it's patchy and the, the same pattern isn't happening everywhere. So we're hoping to keep getting there, keep doing our surveys um, and keep tracking the, the changes that are going to occur from from this big disease event. Um, and then finally, after uh, quite a few local extinctions of the sunflower stars. We are beginning to see them, again, mostly further north, but uh, we'll continue to track them and hope that they can rebound a little bit and, and recover as well, since they do play a, a very big role in their environment. All right, uh, with that, I would like to thank our main funders, um, the many people who have contributed to protocol development, field surveys, data collection, data management, um, site access over 30 plus years, and people that made and gave comments and edits to this talk, especially to Melissa Miner and Ronnie Gajam who provided content for this talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge people whose photos we used. And I would definitely like to thank you all for listening. And um, we would be happy to take any questions now. This is a email address that you all can use if you wanna email us later on with questions or comments or anything. This uh, cstarwasting at googlegroups.com will go to Melissa and myself and a couple other coworkers that work on this um, topic and this project. So thank you. And we're happy to take and try to answer questions. I saw quite a few questions coming up in the chat. Let's see, do you both have access to the chat or would you like me to read oh, yeah. them? I see okay. it. Yeah, it can go through. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can toxins from fireworks and its aftermath cause issues to sea stars and or other marine forms of life? That's a good question. Um, I imagine so, but I don't know that I've seen data specifically on that. Um, have you, Laura, heard anything? No, I haven't. Um, yeah, the ocean is a really good um, dispersal agent. Like things get very uh, diluted in there. So it's definitely not great, especially if litter is going into the ocean, but I'm not sure specifically um, fireworks, yeah, how much effect they would have. It's definitely not a like the cause of sea star wasting just because it's, hap you know, the sea star wasting has been happening in many places where um, that are really rural and that there aren't fireworks. Um, so 
yeah, good question. I think that like Laura said, it would affect it, but it's not like the um, reason. Yeah. All right. Let me make my chat a little bit bigger. Yeah, okay. okay. So there used to be many sea stars under T Pier and Mora Bay. Is that a research site on rocks seen um, from walkway down a Coast Guard for patrol boats? Um, I'll let Melissa answer that one. Yeah, we have, so we do have a community scientist um, that has a study site under the T Piers in Morro Bay. Um, and he usually goes out about once a month, kayaks under there and um, he hasn't been seeing very many ochre stars. He sees quite a few bat stars, usually on the rocks. Um, but yeah, it's great. So as Laura said, um, you can go to the um, collaborative monitoring part of the website and you can see his uh, data graphs on there um, under the site called, I think it says Moro Bay T Piers. Okay, are these sea stars protected, illegal to disturb, remove from habitat? Um, I asked as finally a few stars back in Cayucas, but more I'm seeing typos being disturbed, pulled off rocks and left on beach. Do they reattach? Will St. state parks respond to violations? Yeah, so um, people are not, I don't, you can touch them, but people aren't supposed to be taking them. Um, as far as, I don't think they're, it's illegal to touch them, right, Laura? They're not that level of protection. No. Um, they, it depends. If they reattach, if they put them back on the rock. Um, so we obviously don't encourage anyone to pull them off the rock at all. Um, but if someone does and they put them back down on the rock, um, they probably will reattach. Um, if someone leaves them on the sandy beach, then they're probably not going to make it. Uh, and as far as I don't know, um, state parks involvement, um, as far as violations go, I think the Department of Fish and Wildlife would probably respond if there was, you know, if you saw a lot of, you know, people taking a lot of sea stars off and that sort of thing. Um, but state parks does resource protection too. Like, yeah, okay. that's totally primarily a fish and wildlife thing, but yeah, um, they definitely issue citations like. I know they really monitor the marine protected areas and things like that. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Mallory. Have you identified the causes of the recent increased populations up north? If so, how mm -hmm. confident are you that those are indeed the causes of the increase? Um, so that's a good question. Um, we mostly monitor trends and patterns. As ecologists, we aren't able to really pinpoint the exact um, causes of things per se, because we're not doing manipulative experiments. I would, if I were to take a stab at it, I would say the, the cooler water temperatures up there are really helpful because as we um, mentioned, it's kind of warmer temperatures that are exacerbating this disease. Um, so that would be a, a guess at why they're doing better up north, um, but you ask about our confidence and I can't say that we know for certain that's exactly why things are better up there and, and what's going on. But. Yeah, I was looking at um, a uh, the warm blob at some images of the warm blob from 2013 to 2015. And at least the images I was looking at did seem like Oregon and some of Northern California weren't looked like they weren't as affected as pretty much everywhere else. There were seems like they had um, uh, smaller changes in temperature. So I I was thinking that that um, might be why they're doing better there. They didn't have um, that big several year long event that a lot of places did, but that's yeah, like Laura said, um, some speculation. And then I see, have there been subtitle assessments of sea star populations? Yeah, good question. Um, that's obviously a really big part of the story. We're, um, our group is only looking at uh, part of it. Um, I, yeah, so we, uh, there are some different groups that do subtitle surveys. Um, at UC Santa Cruz, there is um, a group that focuses on that. And um, I was looking at their data recently and uh, C star, well, I was looking specifically at the ochre stars and um, they declined subtitling as well. I was wondering whether they, you know, 
it was more that they were moving down into the subtitle rather from the intertitle rather than being gone. Um, so I looked at those data to check and at least for the sites where um, our intertitle surveys and their subtitle surveys overlap, um, that was not the case. It looked like there was no clear pattern of, you know, um, our numbers going down and the subtitle numbers going up. Um, so it seemed like uh, they were also going down subtitly as well. So actually disappearing, not just moving lower. Yeah, good question. And, and there are subtitle groups, um, not just at UC Santa Cruz. There's a group at UC Santa Barbara that, that does long-term subtitle monitoring down there. The Channel Islands uh, National Park has a subtitle program. There's um, Reef Check up north around Fort Bragg. They do um, subtitle surveys up there. So yeah, there is good coverage and, and data being collected about um, subtitle stars and, and the disease present there too. Let's see, is there a, did we already answer this one? Is there a causal microorganism linked to the survey? So um, I very briefly mentioned that uh, a number of years back, there was a study that came out that thought that a, denso, a specific denso virus was associated with sea star wasting. Um, a more recent study uh, looked at that again, and it seemed, or their findings were that the um, that dendrovirus was uh, common in healthy stars as well. It wasn't just the diseased ones. So I think that it sounds like it's more of, there may be more um, of this virus and some other viruses on diseased ones because the lesions, um, the uh, microbes sort of, um, you know, are attracted to or whatever on the lesions. So they may have more, but it's not causing the sea star wasting, whereas it might be more of an effect of them having lesions on their body that they end up with more of these um, viruses and such. Okay, let's see. The rocks between first and ninth streets in Pecos are covered with pisaster up to 15 in a line on one rock. So that's good and exciting to see. That's the kind of thing if you're doing that walk a lot or you live close by and you're invested in that population, you could um, submit those observations on our on our website. That's a cool thing to know about and hear about. So, and like we said, there are pockets of areas that are doing better, better than some places than others. It's It's all kind of patchy. And hello to Ms. Chapman, my uh, high school science teacher. <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming. Um, yeah, did you say, Laura, that our our sites at Astero Bluffs? Oh are, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was just yeah, that's where ours our site is. So um, yeah, we should go check out other parts of Cayucas. Oh, Laura did. Oh, you froze for a second. Okay. Do you think the Fukushima, oh, my internet is unstable. Can you? I can still hear, hear you, me? yeah. Okay, good. It's fine right now, I'll tell you if you're Do not. Do you but... think the Fukushima species eruption has had an effect? So um, we've gotten this question before um, and it's unlikely, um, yeah, what's the best way to explain that? Um, if it were, having a big effect, it would be impacting almost every species out there in the intertidal zone. It wouldn't necessarily just specifically have an effect on one. one. Um, let's see, I don't know, Melissa, what are some other good? Yeah, no, I think that that's exactly right. That if yeah. it was Fukushima, it, we, I think that there would be a lot more uh, uh, critters out there that we're, you know, we'd be seeing an effect with. It wouldn't just be sea stars. Um, and there, there were people that did actually go out and use Geiger counters and take readings and scientists that specialized in that type of thing that, that weren't finding um, crazy levels or, or damages from that. So um, it's unlikely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, oil, tar spills, both natural and man-made have cropped up at various times up and down the coast, specifically since 2018 to 2021 along the central coast, creating dead spots where the tar clings to the tidal zone rocks. Would that contribute to the difficulty of the sea stars to make a comeback? Oh, interesting question. Um, I don't know that that would play a big part because when, at least when we go out to our sites, uh, that doesn't seem to really be a big issue. I mean, we obviously see tar, we, see, we do see natural tar a lot at our sites. Um, 
usually when we see it, it's more, it's higher, higher in the intertidal than the sea stars are. Um, and um, yeah, so I feel like uh, that could play a small role, but I doubt that it has a very big impact. Yeah, I think if, yeah, if tar landed directly on an organism or a sea star, it would be detrimental because of the poisonous hydrocarbons. It wouldn't be great for that to have like direct contact with the sea star. And that would maybe not be good for that one individual. And, and, or it could be like Mel was saying, if it covered an area, it could preclude a sea star from, from being on that spot directly. But um, those accumulations usually do occur a bit higher than the stars are usually found. So probably not a huge impact from that. Yeah. Um, is there any effort to introduce small sea stars that were raised by us into the ocean? So that's an interesting question as well. And um, it's difficult to do projects like that um, just to get permitting and, and go through California um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and get permission to do that um, because you have to be careful when you grow things in the lab. There could be tiny things in the water tables that you could inadvertently be transplanting out into the wild that could have negative impacts and stuff. But um, they are thinking of that, as I mentioned, up in um, at Friday Harbor Labs in Washington on the San Juan Islands. There's a lab up there that's um, starting to breed little baby sunflower stars um, with the potential of maybe outplanting them at some point. But right now, they're just doing that um, to gain kind of biological information about their life history patterns and, and that sort of thing. So there is no big effort like that around us uh, or with um, ochre stars, but potentially in the future, there could be an, an effort to try that with the sunflower stars. Are the percent drops in heat maps relative to previous year or long-term average? You know, one of our colleagues uh, made these heat maps. Laura, do you remember how, how exactly they were made? I think it's relative to previous year, but I can't say for sure. Do you remember? I'm not positive. I haven't talked to Melissa about that. I texted her, but yeah. she hasn't responded. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Maybe we'll get <laughs> Yeah. So I'm um, sorry. We can't very uh, clearly answer that because um, we didn't make them. But uh, yeah, I will ask her, though, and find out. <laughs> Let's see, I see some questions in the Q&A too. Let's see, will genetic diversity be constrained by this loss of population or do they recruit from distant areas? That's a really, really good question. Um, and like Mel showed in her um, uh, diagram of the life history, they do have a larval stage that does go out to the sea in the more open ocean where, um, things could mix and then they could wash back on the shore in a pretty different area than where they um, started or where the parents were, um, which could help with that. There is a lot of um, studies happening right now geared directly towards answering this question because that is a big concern. You know, If only a few survived and then they're the parents that are repopulating the coast, you know, is the genetic diversity gonna be pretty low and are they gonna be more susceptible to future disease or could it be that they were the stars that were like super tough, you know, and could resist this and, and the fact that they are repopulating with their genes, could it mean the next generation of stars are actually tougher and they had something that helped them resist this disease? So it's a really good question. A lot more um, attention needs to be paid to it and studies are happening now. We've actually helped to, um, we've collaborated with geneticists and sent them um, tissue samples from the field uh, so they can look at the genetics of the stars that we're seeing and stuff. So good question. Um, at what age do they reproduce? Ooh. Do you remember, Laura, I want to say, I should know. is it like around, I know, <laughs> is, this a, is it around four years or I was so? gonna say three I th yeah or four. I was so thinking three or right four. Around, yeah they can't definitely in the first couple years not when they're one or two but um yeah I think around around three to four definitely five they can begin reproducing yeah. mm -hmm. what's the largest starfish ever seen that is a good question and I have no idea we sometimes um Organisms tend to be larger up 
in our northern sites like Oregon and, and Washington and um, or when they're subtitle or in a really deep pool, they're able to get lots of food and grow really large and they kind of seem to like cold water up there. And so we've seen some that are like, I don't know, like almost the size of my forearm, you know, but um, <laughs> we have yeah, to... sunflower stars are the biggest that they, are, yeah. they get the biggest of, of the ones we see. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, we'd have to pick through our data to come up with like a, a size for you, but they can get really big, definitely. Yeah. Great. How does larval dispersal affect potential recovery in areas distant from source populations? Yeah, I was trying to, because I was trying to remember how far their larvae travel. So like I said, they were, I know that they are larvae for, I think it's like three or four weeks, but I was having a hard time and I should have looked several days ago, but I was trying to um, figure out how far they travel typically. Do you remember, Laura? No? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking about how um, part of the issue too is when there are so few in an area, it may also be harder for them to reproduce. So um, I thought about this more with with the endangered black abalone, I don't know what the distance is for sea stars, but for the endangered black abalone, they have to be within, I think it's like a, a couple meters or so to be able to have a really good chance of reproduction. And if they're within a meter, they're basically golden. But if it's more than that, it's harder for them to have successful reproduction. So um, I believe sea stars are the same. I don't know the distance, but once I was thinking about that with like the Cayucas um, data, that once they're so rare at a site, it might be really hard for um, for them to, to come back. Um, but yeah. Let's see. It looks like there's a few newer ones back in the chat. So um, what do you attribute the higher water temperature to, if not to chemicals, toxins, and nuclear waste? Um, that would have to be climate change, probably. Yeah, it's causing an increase in sea temperatures um, in and a lot the, of places. Oops, so, sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. Um, specifically for the, the warm blob that I mentioned back in 2013 to 2015, um, that was a uh, heating of the air temperature, which heated the um, surface water temperature that um, changed the wind patterns and, um, and brought warmer water from the equator um, further north and towards the west coast of North America. So um, that's not currently, but that is, that's, um, that warm blob, uh, that's what sort of the very, very basic gist of why that happens for a few years um, around when sea star wasting happens. But yeah, like Laura said, overall um, climate change is going to have a bigger impact. Okay. Well, let's see, I see one. What other species have been most impacted by the overgrowth in mussels and urchins as a result of decreases in sea stars? So uh, the first thing that springs to my mind, and I'm a, an algae centric person, that's what I specialize in, is the algae and kelps. Um, uh, urchins, just the overgrowth of urchins is reducing um, kelp abundance subtitally, and then the overgrowth of mussels in the intertidal zone can um, preclude uh, algae from settling. Um, specifically, one of the only threatened seaweeds on our coast in California is a, a little seaweed um, called Pistelsia palmiformis. It's really cute and adorable. It's one of my favorites, but it's um, it looks like a little palm tree that grows in the intertidal zone. And that um, has a pretty hard time growing in mussel beds. It's That's where it only occurs. And it um, if they're too dense, uh, then their little spores drop down between the mussels and then they never get enough light to, to grow and become adults. Um, so that's one species that's a very specific example, but um, yeah, and it, it can affect more than just algae. There's invertebrates that won't be able to settle if, if mussels are hogging all the space too, but those are the ones that, that just jump to the forefront of my mind straight away, yeah. What is the difference between sea stars and starfish? Good question. Um, they're the same. So uh, as scientists, we like to say sea stars because um, they're technically not fish. So um, if you say starfish, that's fine. Um, you hear us say sea stars just because we want to, you know, be clear that they aren't actually fish. But good question. And I think that's about all I see. Are there any, Mallory, that 
saw that we didn't get to or I, I think you got them all you you both you get yeah you were so <laughs> thorough Thank, I really appreciate you staying on and answering all the questions yeah. <laughs> um and thank you everyone for participating and asking your questions too. It, it makes it more interesting. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much to both of you. Really appreciate your time. And I think I can speak for, ev for everyone. We really enjoyed your presentation. Oh. And um, yeah, I certainly learned a lot. So. Great. Well, thank you hey, thanks. for listening. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Yeah. And look okay. for us if you're ever out in the intertidal zone and you see people wearing bright orange <laughs> pants that might be us doing surveys in your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll be looking for you now. All right. Cool. Thank okay, you. everyone. Have a great weekend. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.